Hello, and for the first time ever, welcome to the Napoleonic Wars channel live. I'm your host, Zach White, the guy who runs the Napoleonic Wars podcast, and now the person at the helm of the Napoleonic Wars YouTube channel. To those of you tuning in around the world, welcome. This is a slightly nerve-wracking but hugely exciting moment, and I hope the first of many of these live streams. We've got another one coming up next week to mark the anniversary of the Battle of Salamanca. Be sure to tune in for that. I've got some fantastic footage that I've shot on the battlefield to share with you all. Please do remember to post your comments and questions in the descriptor and the, the comments section at the bottom of your screen. We will be getting through as many of your questions as we can over the course of this next hour and a little bit because if we need to keep talking hey as if we're going to stop answering some cracking questions the focus for this opening live stream is that two and a half minutes of video that it just seems to have set the online community on fire if you thought twitter was a dumpster fire before ridley scott's napoleon trailer dropped well believe me they might as well have chucked an entire tanker load of diesel on the flames because it has truly ignited people from all sides of the debate getting incredibly angry about the depictions of napoleon whether or not napoleon should even have a film about him um, lots of memes being dropped dan snow was a leading protagonist there um, and, and did it very well i have to say so we're going to try and just remove a little bit of the tension and a little bit of the heat out of the discussion, because above all, folks, it's a film. It's meant to be fun. So let's just have some fun. And on that note, I am going to introduce my partner in crime, my first guest on a live stream, my very dear friend, Josh Proven, who runs the Adventures in Historyland YouTube channel. Josh, welcome to the show. You're a dab hand at this sort of thing. So I'm hoping that you're going to help cover up my inadequacies over the course of the next hour. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing very well. Thank you for the very generous introduction as always. Hello, everybody. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, I have never actually done a live stream myself, so um, I've been a part of them before. But I'm afraid we're on our own uh, as, to, <laughs> as to what should and should not be done. Well, you say that you've never done this sort of thing before, but I notice you've positioned your Napoleon books just to the side of your head like an absolute pro. Um, just kind of demonstrating, look, I, I own the right books. I've done my research. <laughs> I, I, I'm glad you noticed that. <laughs> hey, let's stop pretending that it wasn't done deliberately. Um, what I am also noting is that you haven't put your own book in the back of shot, which many, many people would do. So folks, mm. if you're not familiar, Josh is uh, not only a vlogger in history, uh, but he's also a very good... Um, historian in his own right. He wrote Bullock's Grain and Good Madeira, which looks at the campaign in India in the early 1800s. Well worth a read if you can get your hands on it. It's available at hellion.co.uk. But let's get to business. So this trailer dropped and everyone went a bit mad. But what was your initial reaction to the news when they first announced that they were going to do a Napoleon movie? Because for me, that first reaction was fear. I wasn't really expecting that much out of it because I was expecting a sort of what we'd call a Napoleon hagiography, right? This idea we're going to put this guy on a pedestal. He can't do anything wrong. He's the archetypal hero figure. And it was going to descend into that sort of Napoleonic mythologizing that we see a lot in popular perceptions. So that was my gut fear. And actually, when the trailer dropped, I was pleasantly surprised. But what was your reaction? To, to the initial news, as far as I remember, uh, I didn't. I don't think it registered a lot, really. Um, I think I just sort of took notice of it and felt for sort of filed it away in my brain as but another historical movie coming out. I guess I'll have um, to speak about that at some point next year or something like that. Um, <laughs> I think that was probably the extent of it. <laughs> And in terms of the trailer, what was your gut reaction when you saw it for the first time? Because for me, again, you know, I was impressed. I was 
please, sure, we'll talk about this. A bundle of historical errors in there, some of them significant, some of them in the grand scheme of things insignificant. But as an overall feel and as a piece of entertainment, I was looking at this thinking, this is going to get people fired up. And I think that's perhaps what's been missed in a lot of the discussion about this. The fact that the trailer has done precisely the best thing that it could have done, which is make things like this happen. Have people come together to start having a chat about the guy and starting to work out where they, what they know, what they don't know, and start that process of learning. Even if it just means that a bunch of people have gone and checked Wikipedia Hopefully they'll go further than Wikipedia. I say that, you know, as a historian at heart. But no, no, you have to come here, not Wikipedia. You have to come to us. That's what we want you to do. <laughs> cool. You need to subscribe to the Napoleonic Wars channel and to the Adventures in History Land YouTube channel. That was slickly done. I told you you were a pro. But <laughs> anyhow, talk me through your your gut feeling about the trailer. Well, in, in total honesty, I did not want to. I'd forgotten all about it. I'd wanted to. You're not meant um, to admit that, mate. I'd forgotten. I'd forgotten all about that this movie was coming out because I'm a terrible YouTuber and I was not prepared at all. Um, I did not want to care about Napoleon right now because I'm finishing my book on a, a, a siege in the 18th century, um, which once we finish this, I'll be returning to. Um, but I saw that it had come out, and I had recently just done a reaction video to. Total War Pharaoh, I think, and I really, and it's quite easy to do. So I thought, right, well, I have to go and do that. Didn't get to it on the day it released. Got to it the day afterwards. Um, after your good self, I, I bow to your organization because that was that was very that was very well done. It was a very hurried <laughs> afternoon where I suddenly <laughs> realised, oh no, it's dropped today because I thought it was coming out a couple of days later, and I kind of went, oh no, and then I put it up online. And it got blocked <laughs> to what? talk about poor prep. Well, because this might actually happen to the live stream initially, because it's got the two oh. and a half minutes of the trailer in it. Right. Sony turned around and said, no, you can't. You can't have that online. So they they forced a takedown. So I had do you to, want to um you want Do you want to know the trick to that? Um, well, I just had an argument with Sony. That was, that was well, you can I got do that. You, <laughs> you, can, you can do that too, because you were well with your rights to, to review it. Sure, it's free, uh, yes. You, you, you commented on it. Yeah. But that's the point. Uh, I cut my bit, my video into sections, uh, and stopped it every so often and talked about it. Mm -hmm. The rule of thumb is somewhere around twenty seconds per section of video that you must comment on, and that basically means that they don't have a lot of ground to stand on when mm -hmm. they come to you and say, "Oh, you can't use this." So, ah, well, actually, I commented on every single thing that I wanted to talk about as a as a review. However, you got over 14,000 views, so I, I, I didn't get any, even half that. So perhaps... Mate, it's gone crazy. It's on like 30K now. <laughs> exactly. I, I, so I don't know what the hell has happened. They have it's... to care. They have to care to come after you. So well done. <laughs> so talking about... Said... Anyway, yeah, I, I, my, my initial reaction, I'm sorry, was um, it looks like a good, it looks like a good and exciting movie. Um, I couldn't turn my brain off because I wasn't focusing properly and I did clock through the whole thing without just sort of absorbing it. Uh, oh, weird, weird. What's that about? Oh, no. Uh, and and I, I did like bits of it, but it is mm -hmm. just a trailer. So, Well, let's give you yeah. and yeah. Our, our lovely audience the chance to just stop and absorb it. I'm sure you've seen it all before, folks. But if you haven't, here is, and well, frankly, if you have, enjoy it again. Just just sit back, take a sip of your whiskey or whatever it is that you're drinking this evening, and just enjoy the, if nothing else, the visual spectacle that is this trailer, Ridley Scott's Napoleon, out in November of this year. No doubt you've seen the chaos in the streets. We must make an example, or France will fall. What would you do if this assignment of defense was transferred to you?
I promise you brilliant successes. This costume you have on. This is my uniform. So I led the French victory at Toulon. What is your name? Napoleon. As the course of my life has changed, Napoleon. I'm destined for greatness. But those in power will only see me as a sword. I suggest you take the throne as a king. Shall we vote? This vermin has held the world hostage with his egotism and his lack of simple good manners. It's nothing without me. All of Europe is uniting forces against me. What's the outcome of this if you don't succeed? Your Majesty, we are discovered. Good. Guys! It's a trap! I'm the first to admit when I make a mistake. I simply never do. Is anyone surprised that everyone's talking about it? If nothing else, it gets you fired up. There have been so many criticisms. We're going to talk about some of the, the historical problems that are, are layered through that. And sure, you know, folks, Josh and I are, are amongst the, the first to acknowledge that, I mean, we're historians of this period. We're the ones who probably feel most keenly those inaccuracies, along with our, our colleagues, uh, who also specialise in this period. But in terms of just that that zing, it's doing exactly what it was always designed to do. It's getting people talking about the film. And for us as historians, and Josh, don't let me speak for you on this, but certainly from my perspective, the fact that suddenly everyone is talking about the Napoleonic era is brilliant. This is yeah. the drum that we've been banging for... Uh, half a decade if i mean if not more a decade in a, possibly both of our cases so you know this is this is great that finally we have something that is trying to engage people on mass with this period and let's be honest when was the last time that there was a big screen epic production of something to do with the napoleonic era i'm wondering if it's 1970 Waterloo. I'm wondering if we've actually had to wait the full half century for something like this to come along on this scale of this magnitude to really start to, and bear in mind, Waterloo 1970 inspired a generation to start picking up books, start wargaming, to start, I mean, okay, they didn't have computer games back then, but they, you would have picked up the novels and all the rest of it. This has the potential to do that again. And there is a part of me that thinks, if you're going to nitpick just a tiny bit too much, are film producers going to want to invest? Because if you want to enjoy the spectacle, if you want to see these stories on the big screen, you've got to respect the medium. It's not a documentary, right? Mm -hmm. And people embrace the fact that it's not a documentary because that's for me and Josh to do, right? Yeah. That, that's, it's for us to be the nitpicky ones here and turn around and go, well, that wasn't right, was it? In a cantankerous kind of way. But actually, just just sit back and relax over the whole thing and just take it all in. Uh, it's, it's such a great opportunity. Yeah, it is, absolutely. I mean, in terms of when the last time we had this sort of buzz about the Napoleonic Wars, if you don't count Master and Commander... Oh, that's then... a good one. Yeah, good point. But that is a very specific uh, story. It's two ships. 
uh, in the middle of the ocean. It's not quite clear what effect they're having, what, what's going on in the rest of Europe, as, as Aubrey says, you know. We, and the other thing was that Master and Commander just ended up being really unlucky because it came out the same year as mm. Pirates of the Caribbean 1. And, and so everybody had kind of had their boaty moment for that year. And there's um, a weird, there's a weird, you are, like sort of the weird parallel in that actually, because in the 1970s Waterloo um, bombed so badly that um, Kubrick was scared off making his Napoleon, and yes. supposedly Spielberg is going to be making some sort of miniseries on that. So we could be in for an embarrassment of riches, actually. And the fact that the trailer has been so popular popularizes first a compliment to the PR department and whoever is in charge of distribution because well done guys they know what they're doing uh because this is this trailer absolutely gets you going vive l'empereur absolutely it's like let's go boys let's 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 get on let's get let's follow this let's follow this star see where this goes we know where it goes but um the the fact of it is is um it's a very impactful trailer and it, the the response to it suggests a similar response to that of this 1970s one, because that actually had a very big impact at the time. There were special books put out. Elizabeth Longford must have written about a dozen forwards to various things because of it. A lot of historians in the 70s got a lot of uh, attention when that came out because people started asking questions. You know, what's the deal with Waterloo? Now they'll um, ask think- about... What I think Napoleon? one of the people who, who has commented and is watching tonight, I don't know if he's still commenting, David Hollins, um, made a, a really nice point on social media earlier, which was actually you can almost hear a lot of very hurried yes. commissioning <laughs> of books about this period. Uh, and yeah, you're absolutely right. There are people who are going to absolutely milk this for all it's worth. Um, mm-hmm. Not going to lie, in terms of a content creation perspective, I, I'm going to be one of them. You know that there is going to be a rich yes. seam of stuff to talk about off the back of this. There are a lot of misconceptions that will need correcting, mm. of course. That's always the way. But but, but as you said before, and uh, this, at this point, uh, I'd like to direct people to the uh, latest video that came out, which was uh, done by the Musée de l'Armée, in which Emily Loeb um, does a really good summary in a much shorter time than I did <laughs> of what's going on. And she said that, you know, the, the point of a movie is not to convey anyone's point of view except the protagonist. So this is just a trailer. We don't actually know how, it's, how many perspectives we're getting, but at the very least, its job is to convey what the director feels is Napoleon's point of view. And the rest is the purpose of history, she said. And I thought that was very... Uh, very adaptive. I have understood the French correctly because it's in French. But do watch that. Do watch that reaction video because it's it's delightful to see um, how excited she is to see the. She, she wants to pick out the things from her collection in the Musée de l'Armée that they've used, basically. <laughs> and and hey, that's her right, isn't it? You know, this is this is an exciting time for us. You know, we, not every historical period gets. A, a Hollywood blockbuster made about it, right? And so, you know, obviously we're going to be thrilled when people mm-hmm. are suddenly talking about this. One of the big question marks that's been raised has been about casting, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I pronounce it Joaquin Phoenix. I know some people um, pronounce yeah. it Joaquin Phoenix. Yeah. Um, I'm going with the Spanish pronunciation and I'm sticking with it. Um, but I'm probably wrong. Um, nonetheless, the, the point that's been made is the age, right? That mm-hmm. you've got Vanessa Kirby, not Jodie Comer. Apologies, folks. I did make that mistake in, repeatedly made that mistake in actual <laughs> fact in my reaction video. Plenty of people quite rightly pointed out that I was an idiot. Um, but you've got Vanessa Kirby playing Josephine, and the ages, if anything, are inverted, right? So actually, it's Napoleon who's meant to be the young one. And Josephine is significantly older, whereas actually, you know, Hokim is what, on his way to fifty. I want to say, probably. I don't probably. Um, he's been around long enough. Um, so I, I don't think we've insulted him there if, by saying he's on his way to fifty. Um, he looks good. Too right. Too right. Um, 
but there's there's been a lot of criticism of oh Napoleon's going to look too old, Josephine's going to look too young. Personally, I'm not too fussed about that, and I'll tell you why. It's all about the performance. I don't care how old somebody is or isn't. It doesn't need to be about the visual look. What it needs to be about is the portrayal. Mm. And one of the things that has really come out of what we've seen in the trailer, and obviously the trailer is only you know a tiny segment of the whole, um, estimated runtime is going to be about two and a half hours. So we've seen two minutes. Uh, thank you. Somebody's just put in the chat, Hoakim is 48. So we were bang on-ish, more or less. Um, so, um, <laughs> excuse me. So in terms of um, that portrayal, actually what I'm liking is the intensity. So this is something else that people have said. They've done the, the Rod Steiger comparison from Waterloo. Um, Rod Steiger very famously portrays Napoleon and it's a very expressive portrayal of the guy very emotive very shouty and very angry and it's i think it's quite nice for particularly napoleon at a certain stage in his life and this was a point that um the historian claire civita made to me when i was talking to her uh, a little while back for another project where she said that actually if you take any two-year period of napoleon's life he's distinctly different he changes quite a lot over time and so for 1815 when things are sort of falling apart the idea of a very expressive, quite almost flamboyant, very angry, very outwardly expressive Napoleon works really nicely. But when it comes to early Napoleon, actually intensity is the watchword. Think about his his early life at school. We've, we've both done the reading on this. He's not popular, particularly when he's a military academy. And why is he not popular? Because everybody talks about how he's so intense. Everybody wants him to just lighten up. So this idea that you're going to have a really intense character um, portrayal of Napoleon actually really excites me, especially when you're going to counterbalance that with Josephine and start to play out that dynamic of how Josephine is significant in just kind of getting Napoleon to become a bit more palatable to society. Uh, Rachel mm -hmm. Stark um, is, is a very good friend of this show, of the podcast, uh, does a regular feature on Napoleon's marshals. And she makes this point really neatly that it's it's Josephine that is the making of Napoleon when it comes to his airs and his graces because he just doesn't have those. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, the the age difference doesn't bother me either. And actually, now I'm remembering one of the other. I mean, the second thought I had when I heard about the movie was to say, "Oh, who have they cast as Napoleon?" And it was uh, when I heard it was. Um, I actually thought the Spanish pronounced it Joaquin. Because Antonio Banderas says Joaquin in the Zorro movie. But anyway, despite that, um, however you say his name, Phoenix, um, when I heard it was Phoenix, uh, I thought he actually looks like a Napoleon when he's younger, actually, which is kind of weird to say because he's older now and it looks a little less like him generally. But when you know, Phoenix was younger, he looked a little bit like the, the little wiry general that was running around in Italy. And I thought that's actually good casting. Um, See, they should have just got Rod Stewart to come out of retirement. <laughs> yes, they should have, yeah. <laughs> Folks, if you don't know um, what I'm referring to there, if you Google Napoleon crossing the bridge at Arcole, uh, this is a very famous painting. It's it's Avida, commissioned by Napoleon in order to present him in a certain way. And it shows this famous, massively over-mythologized incident where he grabs a French standard and charges forwards with it. And in reality, uh, what he's trying to do is inspire his men to charge across this bridge. In reality, he's actually tackled to the ground almost immediately by one of his staff officers because there's shot flying everywhere and he's going to get his head blown off. But of course, this is Napoleon. He is the genius of propaganda. So he takes that moment and embellishes it into this stunning painting where he absolutely looks the business but he does look disconcertingly similar to Rod Stewart. Um, he does. Uh, and it's actually, it's, it's a fascinating... First of all, that's an interesting thing with the trailer. Uh, we, we may be getting into this at some point anyway, but why is it that the action scenes you see in the trailer, this is just one of my thoughts, uh, why is he not like waving a flag in front of the room? at Arcola or something like that? Why is he on a horse charging? Why have, Why is that not 
The, why is it not the reproduction of the David? That's interesting. I, I'm, I want to know if there's an Arcola scene in this movie. I, I have a, a feeling in my gut that they're just saving it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they, they've got so much that's visually stunning in here. And we'll, we'll talk about this when we do the, the breakdown sort of blow by blow in just a moment. But actually, it's very clear that they are going through and, and picking out those famous paintings. Some of them you can mm -hmm. look at them and, and they're like for like. Um, so I, I have a feeling that there'll be more of this. I can't mm -hmm. believe that they've shown us it's, everything. It's, it's very much in Scott's kind of playbook to... I mean, famously, Gladiator was inspired by a painting, a 19th yeah. century painting of the arena. So. Um, so let's go through some of the questions that have come in uh, recently, just uh, before we start to um, do the breakdown. Um, so we've got one from Spartacus, um, who's saying they'll skip the Battle of Leipzig for sure. Um, that follows on from uh, this individual who go. Apologies, I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not going to insult you by mispronouncing your name. So I'm not being rude. I just don't want to be offensive. Um, who asks? Do you think the Battle of Leipzig will be covered? His fatal defeat. It would be a shame if it wasn't in the film. Great question. We haven't seen any indication of Leipzig. We have seen what might be Moscow. We've seen what might be Waterloo. Um, certainly we've seen a square encircled by cavalry, which fits one of the, the moments of Waterloo. Um, we've also seen that, um, th that, well, we've seen images of what would appear to be either Napoleon on his route to exile in St. Helena on HMS Bellerophon, or... Um, Napoleon on his route back to France after exile in Elba. So we obviously we haven't got the context to that image, but this is what's actually caught a lot of us, particularly myself, by surprise in that this has been billed as a film about Napoleon's rise. It's even talked about in yeah. the descriptor. Um, it's, it's even in the trailer, you know, the epic rise of this guy. And there's been a lot of talk about how this is going to focus on Napoleon and Josephine's relationship, which is fantastic. Really pleased to see that happening. Uh, but in the process to start and see these things, you know, Moscow burning, the, the sort of more of this downfall, that's perhaps where a, a slight element of concern for me comes in, in terms of, I thought this was going to stop at, at 1805. You know, we're going to get to Austerlitz end, and then perhaps there'd be a sequel. Um, certainly that's what I was hoping for anyway. And actually, it looks as though perhaps this is being told retrospectively. That that point has mm -hmm. been made. You know, maybe this whole thing is going to be hindsight. Um, I thought that was a really nice suggestion. I, that occurred to me actually. Um, given the scale of the stuff they put in the trailer, Waterloo is definitely there because there's no other instance that they're going to put in a movie about Napoleon where British infantry are being chucked, like run around by mm -hmm. French cavalry in a square. Um, nor is there any reason for the Duke of Wellington to be in such a movie, and Rupert Everett appears to be the Duke of Wellington, um, a very tea and biscuits Wellington, yes. but nevertheless, yes. um, uh, he's he's there, uh, and there's no reason for him to be in a movie about Napoleon unless Waterloo is in it. Um, I think very strongly that you're going to see a, I think it's, it's called a broken back narrative. Uh, it may start with Waterloo, for instance, or the exile, and it may flash, and, and, and at the end of his life, at the end of his career, essentially, and it will flash back to something else. Maybe, maybe Waterloo is going to be kind of what's happening, and he that, and you'll get him thinking back to the course of his life or something like that. I think that is what is going to be happening because otherwise, it is in grave danger of doing what the Alexander movie did and attempt to do it chronologically too much. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I think the only way, I mean, hey, maybe we're going to get a sort of a Dunes scenario where we're expecting one movie, and actually in the in the, the opening yeah, yeah. sequence, we get part one dropped, and the entire <laughs> cinema just goes mental. <laughs> I don't know, but we would love That'd it to all, happen. That would be awesome, yeah. It, it uh, certainly would. Um, it would make so much more sense if this ended in 1805, actually, 
Uh, yeah, I think but that so. could be a criticism we will save for when we see in the movie and see how they handled it. Precisely, precisely. Um, but a few people have noticed this, and certainly there is that fear. You c- you can't do everything. You can't no. do twenty five years of this guy's life from seventeen ninety through to eighteen fifteen and do it justice in two and a half hours. No, um, this is yeah. why the Spielberg model works mm. much better because actually you can break it down into seven one hour or you know ninety minute chunks. And that would fly as a concept. Would. I mean, I said I said on Twitter a few days ago, I, I would have set a movie in the Egyptian campaign um, or on St. Helena or something like that. But, uh, but where that's I think... because we both love the Egyptian campaign, John, to be honest. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, but the... the um, yeah, it's... It'll be interesting to see how they handle this weight of stuff. Whether, as for Leipzig... Hmm, that is a very dangerous. That, that is a scary thing for a movie producer and a director to put into a movie, um, because of its immense scale. It's a very important battle, no doubt, as is the entire German camp- campaign of that year. But because, unfortunately, it does not actually end the war, and it is arguably not Napoleon's finest hour, um, and it isn't. It isn't even the and it isn't his most famous bad moment because Russia is his most famous bad moment. I will be very surprised if they give Leipzig a lot of air time just because it just basically, it could be a movie in itself. Yes, it could. And, and should be actually yeah. in fairness. Mm-hmm. Um, the, there's so much to talk about there. In fact, we don't have time to get into it properly, <laughs> but yes, um, I can, I have a, a fear that Leipzig is going to be a line you know, set in a courtroom, um, or it's going to be sort of a pan across a CGI generated mm-hmm. shattered remnants of a battlefield. I'll tell you style. what, somebody look at the cast list, see what allied command is uh, in it. Is Alexander in it? Is the Emperor of Austria in it? Alexander is, is in it, but then Alexander mm-hmm. would have to be in it because be, yes. of Austerlitz. Til- and and Til- Tilsit, specifically Tilsit. Tilsit. Um, but also, um, check if Poniatowski is in it. See, this having... has come up, actually. There isn't a detailed cast list um, mm. that, that people have been able to, to get hold of. In fact, we've got um, a, a question coming in here from Alice. Um, is it Alex Smutny? Apologies, uh, again, not trying to be rude with the pronunciation. Um, but it, uh, we've been asked, how sad are you? as we know from casting on IMDb, that there's no Mura or Lan, but we do have Davu, yay. Um, certainly yay in relation to Davu. I, I'm i surprised by that on Mura. Let me just check the... Because the, as you can imagine, we've scrambled around trying to gather what information we can for you folks. Um, so obviously we've got um, Phoenix as Napoleon, uh, Vanessa Kirby as Josephine, Taha Rahim as Paul Barras, Ben Mars as Kulankar. Um, we've got Ludivine Sonnier as Madame Taylor. So she was a socialite. She will be key in that kind of introduction between Napoleon and Josephine. Um, Barras is there because he's the big guy within government. He's, in some respects, Napoleon is almost his protege or one of his protégés at mm-hmm. least. Um and and there's, there's, Barras... actually, there's actually a suggestion that Barras was the guy who introduced Josephine to Napoleon because he was trying to farm her off to somebody. To that's, somebody. that's exactly what I was about to say. That Josephine had been his mistress, right? Um, and he's certainly prodding Napoleon into marriage with mm-hmm. her. Uh, he, he's prodding Josephine as well. He basically turns around and says, "Look, I've got a new mistress. I'm not going to be supporting you anymore." Um, and and you know you love to spend money, so. Why don't you go marry Napoleon? Basically, he's sort my, of trying to. He's, he's my pet well. general right now. So why don't you? Go? <laughs> I mean, it is as being a sort of um, matchmaker goes. I'm not sure I would take lessons from Barris based on that example. <laughs> Probably um, not. Uh, carry on with the list, though. Yeah. Yeah, we have Matthew Needham as Lucien Bonaparte. Um, as has been said, we have Davu, um, courtesy of Joseph Kerkor. Um, we have Zara Alexander, that's Edouard Philipponard. Um, Paul Rees is Talleyrand, the, the 
major diplomats of the period who expletive in coming here, folks. So cover your ears if you're of Need. a delicate disposition. But first um, of all, though, first of all, though, he needs a movie. Carry yes. on. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, but Napoleon called Talleyrand a shit in a silk stocking. Um, <laughs> so you can imagine how that relationship is going to play out. Um, we also have Ney in the form of John Hollingworth, obviously Napoleon's bravest of the brave. I imagine that any kind of Moscow-related scenes are probably going to feature Ney. Um, we have Gavin Spokes as Moulin and Marc Bonnard as Juno, um, one of Napoleon's generals. So we've got an interesting cast list, as folks have kind of pointed to. It's, it's almost as though the marshals aren't going to play a key role. I dislike the absence of Mura because Mura is one of... But I, perhaps this is because to include Mura would complicate things too much because if you're going to do Mura honestly, actually there's... And, and, and put Lan in there as well. You know, these are all guys who would have been contenders for... In fact, some of them turned down the offer of leading this revolt against the government um, at Brumaire mm. in 1799. So to include them would perhaps have just muddied the water too much. Are we going to go into Brumaire and stuff later on? Yes, we are. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's a very... I think this is not the full cast list. It's much too short. I agree. Um, first for, of all... For a start, we haven't got Wellington. There, exactly, and so. he's obviously in the trailer. So, yeah. I mean, that cannot be anybody else. But... <laughs> but um, the... So I think there will be more, and for reasons we'll get into later, I will be stunned if Murat is not involved in this because of things that happened on 18 Brumaire. Okay, folks, we're going to return to the trailer at this point. Um, I'm keeping an eye on the questions that are coming in. Um, we will come back to those uh, in due course. But one thing I am going to pop up is just this comment from Spartacus. Uh, Poniatowski was a legend of a soldier. Yes, he was. Um, if Napoleon had listened to his Polish generals in 1812, he may not have ended up where he was. He ended indeed, up. Indeed, indeed. Um, right, folks. What we're going to do now is we're going to properly dissect this. So we're going to take it apart piece by piece. You've been very patient. You've waited um, 42 minutes, according to my counter, for us to really get into the nitty gritty of this. Um, so buckle up. Um, here we are for a second time, but in f almost forensic detail, if nothing else. Josh, if you need <laughs> me to pause at any point, just do the YMCA um, okay. and, and I'll realize that you want me to stop. Uh, but here we go for a second time, breaking this down. This is the Napoleon trailer. So straight away, the reason I've t we're going to be like this all the way through. Okay. Um, Everybody leaves. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in fact, we've actually picked up a, a viewer in the course of me doing that. So maybe well that's done. the way. Um, but straight away, the cut, 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 a whole series of iconic moments mm -hmm. displayed there and then nice. culminating in the crowning of himself, which, yes, right. he did do. Did. So straight away, you've, you're getting in there um, some inkling that this is going to be very kind of focused on some of those visceral images of the period. And I think this is what's going to really come out of this in terms of trying to... Uh, no worries, we've had somebody just say they've got to go, but thank you very much for coming. Take care. Um, take care, Irene. Um, the whole way through this, it's oh, going that's second, to... that's probably second crossing. Have, have fun wherever you're going. Adios. Um, so in terms of those images, I think it's going to be very heavy on almost the iconography of, of this period. Yeah. Okay. No doubt you've seen the chaos in the streets. Yeah. So this is the first thing that distracted me. Mm -hmm. Is this meant to be Marie Antoinette? Or I is it just an so. aristocrat? I think in so. Which... See, I, I had to hedge my bets in the reaction trailer that I did mm -hmm. um, because I've got that same uncertainty 
-hmm. It doesn't look hugely like Marie Antoinette. It's very clearly an aristocrat, mm -hmm. but the date would suggest Marie Antoinette, right? Yes, I guess it would. I am going to give him the benefit of the doubt and say it's not, even though I it's probably meant going to be. Because, and so I'm going to give him the pass for the trailer that is not Marie Antoinette and it's just an aristocrat because I'm going to give him the credit to understand that when she went to the guillotine, she didn't dress like that. Um, and that, correct me if I'm wrong, somebody, I don't think Napoleon um, witnessed that personally. This has come up immediately in, in the questions. And um, in fact, we've got a few that I'm going to put across um the screen here uh so chris has said napoleon didn't witness this uh, am i right and yes you're right napoleon's elsewhere he's in the south of france so it's not physically possible for him to have seen this uh we've also got people picking up on the arrogance of marie antoinette that kind of disdain actually um that's interesting yes i was thinking about that today actually first of all i actually Everybody, uh, at a certain point, probably because of the Scarlet Pimpernel and the Baroness or Ski or whatever, however you pronounce it, probably likes the idea of the aristocrat retaining their bearing as they go and face the guillotine. Um, you know. But I was thinking that this person is 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 actually whoever's doing this is is giving off a vibe of haughty disdain at the mm. same time, rather than just reserve and sort of gentility. Yeah, I mean, the Marie Antoinette and, and her husband, Louis, were quite sort of resigned to their fate when it came mm. to the end. Um, and there was a degree of humility, whereas this, you're sort of saying sort of tea and biscuits, Wellington, this almost feels like a let them eat cake, Marie Antoinette, mm -hmm. right? Um, now, the point has been made that visually, um, this is Jean-Charles Blanc, um, who said that it doesn't look like Marie Antoinette. Look at the portrait of David um, when she's sitting in the tumbril. And mm -hmm. you know, I agree, that was my first reaction. This is why I had that uncertainty. It doesn't match, but the date does, which is odd. If you're going to talk about an aristocrat being executed at that moment in history, surely you would go with Marie Antoinette. So it, it's all a little bit odd. Jury's, um, jury's out. Have the have have they gone with the big name so people understand what's happening, or mm -hmm. are they going for more the emotion, more accurate emotion yeah. idea of you just using someone exactly? Uh, uh, it, 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 unfortunately, if it's Marie Antoinette, it is ridiculously inaccurate and it's going to confuse a lot of people. And that's one of the dangers of these sorts of movies. But we'll have to see. Ryan Gosling making a really important point here: they're killing two birds with one stone, and I agree entirely. The focus here is about. Napoleon being really uneasy about what's happening in the yes. revolution. Yes. We'll, we'll, um, we'll want to get into that. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, we're gonna we're gonna stay with that right now because it is the the next part of this trailer. We must make an example, or France will fall. What would straight away there? You can see the look on Napoleon's face, and this is what I liked. Right? It wasn't. It was a, a very honest depiction of of the emotion um, mm. from Napoleon. And that emotion was unease, almost mm. disdain for the mob, because he regarded mm. the mob as potentially quite dangerous. We, yeah. we, I mean, there's this, there's been this hype in the trend, you know, he comes from nothing. <laughs> no, he doesn't. He, he comes doesn't. from minor aristocracy. So... <laughs> You know, there's always going to be that question of where does this end for him? Um, that's that's a, a concern. And Napoleon is fundamentally a political chameleon, for me at least. I've always felt this about Napoleon. Can you pin a single ideology on him? For me, no, not really. He shows some interest in Jacobinism, but then also walks away from it when he needs to. Um, Napoleon's style for me has always been pragmatism first. Um, you know, in a, in a weird way, one of the main sort of, if you can call it, political ideologies that he carries through is is some is a some sort of, some sort of species of enlightened aristocracy, which is strange. Yeah. <laughs> in a, in a, it's which is strange to say, but he retains a certain 
well-bred intelligence and devotion to liberal causes that a lot of aristocrats had espoused in the of the ancien regime yeah so we're we're going to keep going with this um lots of people offering comments in the chat please do keep your thoughts coming in folks please also remember to like and subscribe yes i know streamers always say that but actually you've got no idea it'll take you 10 seconds well it will take you one second to hit that like button it'll make mm -hmm. a massive difference in terms of the people who are watching this so for the mm -hmm. algorithm please do whack that like button yes. if you're enjoying subscribe so you can find your way back um yeah any but, any time stop by um, Please do. Um, as as you were saying, the the his attitude to the terror, to the 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 mob, to to the way France sort of went from 1793 to the time he got involved in politics, is is typified. And I said this in my video that it shouldn't be Marie Antoinette; it should be the storming of the Tuileries, which is the comment which, we just had come in. Absolutely. Yes. And he, that is why he mistrusts the mob. That is why he mistrusts a lack of order. That is where famously, I don't know if it's legend, I don't know whether he actually wrote about it, but he wandered the rooms of the palace, looking at all the dead guards, seeing them being massacred after they'd laid down their weapons. And that stuck with him. And it would, have, it would be so cool actually knowing what scene comes next. If they had shown that as as this as this scene because that stayed with him i think through his entire life i am not going to end up like like louis and his guards my guards aren't going to get hacked to pieces by a mob sort of thing folks preempting what's coming next so i'm not going to keep them on tenterhooks any longer here's the next part of the sequence and this is so this really interested me in terms of how it's partly inaccurate but also it's well, sort it, of it, it depends whose account you believe well, well, get... well yes <laughs> uh, and this perhaps gives us some indications of where they've gone with this and we'll talk about the historical advisor to the show in, in just a moment so to the film in just a moment um let me let me suspend my comments <laughs> and and we'll we'll show you what i'm in this yeah. assignment of defense was transferred to you. So again, so this is the whiff of grape shot moment. Um, it's a, a phrase that was okay. coined by Scottish historian Thomas Carlyle. Um, but as a lot of people have picked up, we've got some history fans uh, in the in the show uh, comments this evening. It's it's wrong, actually, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, it's Napoleon's version of what happened as much as anything else. It's actually Murat who secures the guns, um, rides almost sort of hell for leather through the streets, almost kind of bowling people down, yeah. um, trying to get these guns back to defend the government. So this is the Vendomia rising, is, the Royalist is rising. rising. Um, there has been this kind of portrayal of unarmed women and children gunned yeah. down in the streets um that is it's it's not really frank but what i find interesting is that because th that is the popular perception of what happened that's that's the what that's the version that has been picked up by history yeah and the portrayal is very frank mm. about the implications of that you've got people running away screaming people who are um on crutches you've got women <laughs> running away all of so they what they're doing is they're, they're taking. They're, dra out. they're dramatizing. It's... They are, but it's a very frank look at what oh. is, if it were true, a really yeah. unpleasant moment in Napoleon's story of his his rise to power. So they're not shying away from no. the horror and the controversy, even if that controversy and horror isn't actually the reality of what happened. It's an interesting kind of little problem that they're wrestling oh. with there. Well, it is. I, I, one of the things I liked about, first of all, one of the, my favorite points of the trailer was this cut between them asking the question, what would you do if you were given this <laughs> defense? Bring in the guns is what I would do. <laughs> and that's exactly what the story, how the story goes uh, at Van Um Barris is involved. Barris and Napoleon are the lead uh, sort of 
uh, accounts of what happened here. Barris takes the credit on his self, uh, for himself. Uh, Barris actually says that Napoleon did nothing but act as my aide-de-camp. And he wrote this when he was very bitter about Napoleon slighting him from the government, it has to be said. And on the other hand, you have Napoleon, who is saying that um, he took, he, he sent Murat out and he did all these things. Barra said he did all these things. Barra even credits General Brune with command of the artillery, not Napoleon. However, Napoleon gets the reputation of General Vendemier afterwards. Barris shows him off as the hero of this. Why would you do that if he didn't play a decisive role of some sort? Is it just because of Toulon? I mean, these are questions that are difficult to ask, but I would like to point out that just because Napoleon takes the credit for something doesn't actually mean it isn't true. He may have had actually a role to play similarly, not exactly as important, but similar to to what we understand. And of course, Murat was involved grabbing all those artillery. And this is why, this is why it should have been the Tuileries at the beginning of the trailer, because the, this is, the Tuileries is what the mob are trying to attack. Napoleon knew how to defend this place. He'd seen it be taken by a mob. And of course, as you said, the, the mob is actually mostly National Guards. Yeah, absolutely. Um... Folks, keep these questions coming in. Um, we we will continue to to cover these aspects as we go through. But yes, it's it's an odd moment. Um, oh, let's let's just take a moment to talk about the historical advisor to this. Who my sources? I say that my sources <laughs> <laughs> talk about grandiose comments <laughs> there. Um, I have heard rumours. Those are my sources. I have I'm named rumors. sources. Um, that it may have been Michael Brewer's, which is... Well, that, that would be very impressive. It would be very impressive. Um, in some respects, it makes a deal of sense. Um, another person who's been implicated at times has been Alan Forrest, I believe. But the the most recent ones, the most recent mm -hmm. bits of information I've heard are Michael Brewer's, who well, is um, the, the author of one of those books, Over Your Shoulder. Um, so he's he's done a few books on Napoleon. He's basically sort of cha charting his way through his life. My favorite um, books about Napoleon, uh, actually, is Michael Brewer. So he he actually treads a fairly middle line, which is nice. Yeah, yeah, I I agree. My expectation was that we were just going to pick up the phone to Andrew Roberts, who wrote <laughs> for those of you who aren't familiar, Napoleon the Great, which is a a fun read. Um, bearing in mind that I'm a Napoleon skeptic, so obviously that clouds my my judgment and my assessment. I am of the opinion that it is far too sympathetic a view of Napoleon's life. My reading of Napoleon's actions are um, much more cynical, put it that way. Um, and as a result of that, I feel that Napoleon the Great sort of skates over certain issues, especially the whole brouhaha in Spain. Um, and so I, I, I'm not as much of a fan when mm -hmm. it comes to that particular book. Uh, doesn't mean that you shouldn't read it. You should read all the perspectives. Um, equally, Philip Dwyer wrote two, uh, what, in fact, there are three volumes, um, on what, on Napoleon's, uh, life. Uh, Philip Dwyer is much more cynical about, um, about Napoleon. Uh, they're really interesting books to read. Uh, I don't entirely agree with everything that's um, been been written in, in the third volume where Napoleon gets a comparison to Jesus. I think you can <laughs> take the argument too far. Um, that's that's my um, sense of this. In fact, people are, are flagging these. So folks, check the, the, the comments section you've got people um talking about various titles if you um, want to if you want a sort of a single volume one that isn't too pro isn't too negative there's also zamoyski who's behind yeah. my head as well yes, very good indeed. read yes uh that was the other one you preempted what i was going to say it's almost like we're used to talking about this stuff josh um <laughs> some people are, are talking about the the roberts uh, the andrew roberts documentary um <laughs> which which backed up the it was a bbc um three-part series that backed up the publication yeah. of the book. Um, I must admit, Andrew lost me 
at the point at which he basically told Napoleon critics to get over themselves. Um, <laughs> that, that, that didn't sit well with me. I just thought that was unnecessary. Um, but I would encourage people, as a historian of the period and somebody who actually disagrees with Andrew's perceptions, to go and read his work. Mm. You need to look at both sides of the argument and see which side you come down on. That's there was the even there was even a very interesting recorded debate, uh, which was chaired yes. by um, oh, what is his name? Pa my kind Paxman. of. Paxman, yes, Jeremy. Thank you, Jeremy Paxman, uh, between uh, Adam Zamoyski and Andrew Roberts, uh, in which they argue between each other very in a very civilized manner. In fact, I think Paxman was quite disappointed that they weren't clawing in each other. Mm. <laughs> um, that uh, whether Napoleon deserves to be known as the Great. Yeah. Um, so if that's online, still, you should check that out. Yeah. Um, the one of the best lines. And that is where um, Adam Zamoyski takes the mick out of Andrew Roberts for the fact that he looks disconcertingly like <laughs> Napoleon. It's a brilliant moment. I strongly recommend you it. You know what? The, like, he, he does look disconcertingly a, a little like Napoleon yeah. in certain lights. Zamoyski looks a little bit like Metternich. <laughs> that, that's true. I've been sort of <laughs> struggling to think. I knew there was something in there that was kind of <laughs> clawing at the back of my head when it came to the moist skin and the polio finger. But now that you've put it, now that you've said it, actually, I, I'm with you on that. Um, but we are going to um, flick back to the trailer, folks. So here's the next segment. I promise you brilliant successes. I can't work out what this is. What am I, I missing here? I know this. Right. We're, we're, we're the, this is the this is the trailer just messing with our heads here. This is after Toulon. This is directly after they've taken the fort. See the walls in the background, I'm and he's you. wearing his artilleryman's outfit. Ah, okay. There you go. You've you've soothed my soul. That he's, was he's a wash talking, with uncertainty. Yeah, he's talking to the the um, representatives of the of the of the government who are there being a pain. Um, okay. Day. Everyone. Some of my favourite films just flash up on the screen randomly. What is this costume you have on? So this got some heat. You know, Josephine yeah. would have spent her life around soldiers. She'd have known what the uniform looked, what the uniform was. Yes, people, but yes. storytelling. Come well, on, you've got to allow well, them a bit of licence. Right. As well, though, I'm very glad. I'm happy we've got to this point. Now, in, I... I gave this scene a bit of a hard time myself because I didn't know what was going on. I couldn't recognize exactly if this was meant to be Josephine or not, right? And this is one of the things I, I think that is useful. I'll use myself as the example. So I give this a hard time. I didn't want to comment on it particularly. I said the less we say about this, the better because jo Josephine was et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and moving on. I looked into it though because this is such a uh, it's a very sort of striking moment in the trailer, and you find out things when you look into stuff that you see on TV. And first of all, uh, and this is actually explained in the in the video from the Musée de l'Armée uh, with Emily Robe, and she says uh, pretty much what I found out, which I was so happy to <laughs> so, so happy to see, but that. This is some sort of if I've earned, if I'm understanding the, the the French right that it's 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 basically she's dressed up as if she's going to the guillotine. This party there were parties held in Paris that were either in aid of or to commemorate or something people who died and unjustly died or people who were needed aid because they lost relatives or something like that. That bit I'm not one hundred percent clear of because I'm I couldn't understand the French precisely, but. Her hair is cropped as people, it's uh, like coiffure de decapitation or um, de, de la guillotine. And so you crop your hair when you go to get executed. The very plain dress she's wearing is meant to be the, the, the chemise uh, of those condemned to death. Around her neck, she's wearing a red ribbon which is meant to show the blood, like to represent the blood. So this is actually, weirdly, a, quite a detailed study of, of a type of 
cultural or societal thing that I was not aware of at all until I looked into it. And, um, and the red band is just so dark, so delightfully dark <laughs> around her neck. <laughs> but um, this, I, you, using myself as an example, this is why, you, first of all, you can learn stuff just by watching good and bad. If you stop just by watching, you then have to go and ask the questions and find out. Because I only found out the significance of all of this because I then went and looked it up. This is probably one of Paul Barris's parties. I'm wondering if it's Madame Talion's. Um, Could well be. At Salon. You know, well, the, no, the nobody meeting. Because she, isn't she significant in getting Josephine out of prison? At one yes, because this is another thing. This would be very. This is very deep for Josephine, and it's. It, 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 I mean, I am shown up how little I know about this woman, and how most of us don't know squat about the women of this this period, practically. Which is what's so great about this, right? Um, that yeah. finally we are getting Josephine not on an equal footing to Napoleon. That was always going to be the case, and in terms of the history, that's right and proper. Um, but nonetheless, we get a much more significant depiction of Josephine that brings things probably back into a far better, far more realistic kilter mm. than they have been up until now. You know, you get a much more human depiction yeah. of the Josephine. She, she was in. She was in the. Uh, she was in one of the infamous prisons. She was locked up um, for suspicion of 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 treason by the, the, the you know what is it the well Robespierre's lot and. Um, her husband was guillotined. Uh, her ex-husband, I should say, was guillotined. And so for her to show up like this is like almost it is very deep for her character. And it, it you can look into it, layers into it, because she was a survivor. She'd been through a lot, right? She she had been through hell, probably maybe probably more hell than Napoleon had ever been through. And she'd come out of it. And this is her trying to find at last some sort of security. And when Barris says, I have this guy, meet him, this is this is what this is. Yeah. Um, I mean, I somebody's asking, you know, is this just dumb? Is this a dumb line? No, because oh, the that... point has been made. And, yes. and I, I feel this very strongly, that what they're showing here is the sass of Josephine. They are showing her not as this sort of meek, yeah. submissive, oh, I'm being swept off my feet by Napoleon. She uh -huh. is an intelligent woman in mm. her own right who yeah. isn't just bowled over by <laughs> Napoleon's sort of animal magnetism or something, oh. which I think is how people like to portray this relationship because actually was... Napoleon's the needy one. Yeah, He's the one who's desperate to have Josephine love him. And yeah. Josephine has to be almost convinced into this relationship with she Napoleon. She, she continues does. with her lovers shortly after. Sorry, no, I keep cutting <laughs> you off. Um, I'm just agreeing. I'm, I'm just agreeing. Yeah, I'm. I'm on a roll here. She carries on with her lovers, or certainly one of her lovers, um, shortly after Napoleon heads south, just after their marriage. So, yeah. you know, there's very much a, a kind of a sense here that this this is a relationship where she's wearing the trousers just as much as Napoleon is, and I think that's more much more honest. She was not impressed with him at first. Um, she she played him like a fiddle. He came out of that first meeting absolutely besotted with him because she knew how to flatter important men. This is pretty good, actually. She comes up to him and this is this, she's flirting with him. She's saying, "And what costume are we? Are you wearing then to get a reaction?" She's wearing a costume. She's going. She's she's dressed like she's going to the guillotine for heaven's sake. So this is this is good. This is this is this is uh, uh, this is a vibe. Neil Carey just coming in. I'm just going to answer this quickly. Um, Neil, apologies, <laughs> we did cover this earlier. But yes, you're absolutely right. Um, Josephine had been Barris's mistress, and then he found a new mistress and was keen to prod Napoleon and prod Josephine into getting married. So yeah, you're dead right there. Um, we will continue with uh, this trailer and marvel at the sass from Vanessa Kirby's Josephine. Uniform. So near. I love the French victory at Toulon. Narcissism there. It's all about mm. me. I led the French victory at Toulon. You know, I, I, I'm the big I am. Um, somebody asked earlier about, wasn't Napoleon wounded? Yes, he uh, took a bayonet 
to the thigh, courtesy oh. of a British soldier, um, and was lucky yep. to keep the leg, in fact. You know, one of a oh. number of instances. No worries, Neil. That's absolutely fine, mate. Um, one of a number of instances where um, actually the course of history kind of hung on a knife edge. Another one being, what if Nelson manages to corner Napoleon as he's sailing for Egypt? That's a, that's another moment that I'm sure we won't see. No. Um, no, this is this this is one of the the bits that I had a problem with just because just because I know that Fort Mulgrave, which is the thing that he's supposed to be taking here, which was one of the important uh, fortifications that guarded the harbor, and for once it was taken, forced the British to get out, otherwise they would be bombarded. First of all, the arrogance is somewhat earned. The French were not having a great time at Toulon until he came True. up and kind of just went on his own thing. He was off on the, the, the southern side of the fortifications, I think, and he had this battery. And it's legendary. He liked he he like he 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 told his men, This is a dangerous battery, and I only want men with balls uh, to come up and, and fight in this. And it became like known as like the the the, the iron balls battery or something like that. I don't know. And it, he he led from the front. He did, as you said. He got wounded, literally. Um, he was a very brave man, as a young officer, as young officers should be. And he wanted to show off to the rep to the representatives who were of the directory that were watching. Um, the problem with this is that Mulgrave was a timber and earth fortification, much tougher to take than that, by the way as a result, um, because that thing is, that thing could have been blown. He wouldn't, even, he wouldn't even have needed to attack that, right? He would have just blown it to pieces with his artillery. Yes, yes. Um, so that's, as I said, in the, as I said in, the, in my video, what are you doing, Ridley? It's not Kingdom of Heaven. But, but this is the thing. If you didn't know otherwise, you would think, and I had to watch this a few times to try and work it out, is that... Napoleon um, trying to lay siege to um, uh, Jaffa. You know, is that what we've got going on here? Um, but it, it's it's not. It's, yeah, there's nothing uh, to no. suggest I, it. I, and, I, and in terms of time, alas, alas, I must uh, confirm he is wearing a uniform of the artillery. Uh, he's not a general, and therefore it is. Uh, you see in a, in a second something that confirms it. Josh with the eye for detail here. Um, Generals and Napoleon, a popular podcast um, uh, of, of the period, uh, just flashing up here, saying um, that he likes the arrogance of Hawkins mm. one-liners in the trailer. I strongly agree. Um, yeah. The arrogance, the narcissism yes. comes across very strongly. And that gives me a lot of reason for encouragement, actually. Yeah. This, is, this is a much more honest Napoleon than I thought we were going to get. You know, this isn't... I'm I'm all sweetness and light and you know cuddles and kittens. Yeah. Um, the the yeah. guy goes on to become a dictator. He's Same. he's intensely narcissistic, and mm. actually that's coming across really neatly. It is, and this is one of the things I liked about it as well. You're not getting just a hero. Yeah. This is a complicated person. Yes, who's been through a lot, and that's being conveyed here. And honestly, though, he he had the right to say, I led the French attack, uh, victory at Toulon. Why he has to specify the French is, is interesting. <laughs> but who, who, what other victory at Toulon did you lead? But um, the, he, he, had the, he had bragging rights for that because it was his battery that forced them out, although he was not in command. So he, but he became a celebrity because of it. Everybody knew that Bonaparte was the guy who, who got the guns in position. Mm -hmm. And that's the place, legendarily speaking, when when he saw the British fleet leaving the anchorage, he turns to um, Juno, which was which, which is how far back he and Juno went, um, and said, uh, "Never interrupt your enemy when he's making a mistake." There you go, that very famous line. Right, so that's complete rubbish. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. That's. Uh, if, you see what I just you... said there. You see what I just said there. This is what you didn't want to do. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> yeah. Um, so, folks, if you're thinking, oh, hang on a minute, is this Lorient, um, the flagship yeah. at the Battle of Abakir Bay going up? No, it's not, because as you'll see in the foreground, you've got gun emplacements. So this is still too long. Uh, we've got no idea um, if uh, we're going to get any indication of the Battle of Abakir Bay, which you and I probably know as the Battle of the Nile. I would love to see it on screen, but in terms of runtime, I don't think there's going to be the space for it. I just yeah, don't. Berlin, so again, I think it's going to be yeah. a sort of legacy pan of uh, a sea littered with wreckage kind of moment. The British uh, fleet that was lost, um, which just just retreated after coming under fire, pretty much. Mm -hmm. What is your name? Napoleon. Has the course of my life just changed? I love that. Has mm -hmm. the course of, just just not giving an inch? No. Playing so hard to get, um, and and as you said perfectly, you know, playing him like a fiddle in the process. That's what I'm loving about this. It's those kinds of details that are going to give us a far more mm -hmm. deep appreciation of the humanity behind these people. It's, it, it's flattering to him as well, right? He's going to read that as, Haha, I, I, okay, you know, you're in the palm of my hand right now. Mm. But you can read into it as well that she's sort of like just seeing what he's about. How easy are you to wrap around my finger? <laughs> Napoleon. Right, so we talked earlier about <laughs> bingo. We need we need to play bingo with this movie, right? We're going to need to play. We really bingo. do. We we should probably. I mean, I need to investigate the legalities behind it, but Napoleon Bingo might well be <laughs> um, something. In fact, we could probably do that with another trailer. In fact, probably. as part of a live stream, just play Napoleon Bingo. <laughs> um, I think that would be quite an amusing one. So this is one of the iconic paintings. Uh, it's by uh, Jean-Léon Jérôme, and it's Napoleon Before the Sphinx, uh, painted in 1886. Yes, I did have to check my notes to make sure I got the details right there. Um, but Brilliant it's a very, painting. very famous... Amazing painting. Mm, stunning. Uh, unfortunately, the technicalities of the programming, I can't pop this up alongside this image to show you guys, but they've they've copied it almost it, it will, frame for frame. It, it, your draw should your your jaw should drop when you see that painting and you see how ridiculously accurate the Sphinx is in it. Um, for a start, why they insist on putting sepia tones on these things, I have no idea. You, you'll see from the painting that it looks just as nice, just as impressive with a blue sky behind it rather than this dusty nonsense. But very well, very nice, very nice callback to like some iconic later French celebration yeah. of Napoleon. Absolutely. Just had a question come in from Connor. Yes, Connor, there absolutely are. <laughs> oh, and yes. believe me, we will go to town on that <laughs> when it comes around. No. Uh, girl, <laughs> no. girl moment for so many people, right? <laughs> I mean, hey, at least they didn't show Napoleon shooting the nose off the Sphinx, which also didn't yeah. happen. But, folks, very sorry to break it to you, but Battle of the Pyramids actually happens about nine or ten miles away. I think it's nine and a half miles away from the pyramids. So within sight of them, for sure, but mm -hmm. not at the base of them. There was no artillery fire knocking holes no. in the Great Pyramid of Giza. Even if, even if there's, there's some unknown evidence that are straight, no, uh, no, this is actually, no, I've just thought of this, this is just incompetence. Um, if this scene is playing out the way this is supposed to, that they've just fired over the heads of whatever they're firing at into, this, into the pyramids. Anyway, a, a cannon at most, if it's 20, 23, 34 pounder, can fire a shot about a mile. Yeah, no, it's, it's absolute nonsense. Um, at least they're not doing the big Hollywood style Masses of petrol explosion. Um, <laughs> yeah. and that's very clearly sort of a, a cannonball that's impact, that's rather nice. than hey, let's let's let some gasoline on fire, uh, ooh, which obviously ooh, wasn't ooh. the case for uh, even shells during this period. When they exploded, it was sort of puff of smoke and outfly the fragments of of lethal metal kind of thing. Um, so small mercies maybe, yeah. but I, I'm clutching at straws 
in a sense it's, that it's not sort of looked at and go nah, no just no this is bad it. this is this is this is this is just definitively bad <laughs> um I mean, I'll be interested to see whether they give him a, the speech at the pyramids, the centuries of history thing. So that would yes, be, that could be a good speech to include, even though I'm not really sure if it actually is corroborated as happening. But destined for greatness. I'm just going to pick up on the things in the air thing because that was picked yeah. up by some folks. Going, what's he? He's an artillery officer. He'd never do that. I wonder if that's a little trope that they're going to dot the whole way through because mm. at the Vendomier, uh scene, again, you've got Napoleon fingers in the ear, but for Austerlitz, no fingers in the ear. And I wonder if this is going to be a sort of a little artistic... A little arc. Yeah, thing that they, they play. And, you know, the breaking of the arc, Napoleon crowns himself emperor and suddenly he rises to whatever it is that he's seeking... Um, to be in in this sort of character arc of the film, wouldn't um, it be wouldn't it be fun if Napole if there was some sort of little scrap of information about that Napoleon didn't like the sound of gunfire or something like that? I don't know of it, um, but it's, it would be interesting if that was the case because he had his quirks, did Napoleon, about various things. Um, he certainly did. I yeah, I don't know of any. I, I've not actually heard of many or. You hear of artillery officers essentially being mostly deaf at the end of their lives and stuff. Uh, uh, certainly people lost considerable amounts of their hearing from being around these big guns. Um, but I, I don't. you don't really often hear many accounts speaking of people trying to protect their ears from the sound. No, I imagine it would be quite pointless, not least because a musket going off is enough to actually make your ears ring, and I speak from experience. Mm. Um, so you know, you know, these these guys are soldiers, folks. As ever, please remember to like and subscribe. Um, it's helping the algorithm. We are picking up viewers, so thank you for your support, uh, and do stick around um, if you're able to, as we continue to break down this trailer. Let those in power only see me as a sword interesting with the cavalry so i'm just going to rewind <laughs> a tad so we've got a, a nice image another thing did napoleon ever lead a cavalry charge um i've been racking my brains on this one i can't think of one that comes to mind i i know no i know i i cannot remember from memory of anybody saying he led one he's he's in his general's uniform here for a start yeah, uh, he's backed by chasseurs or line dragoons from the Republican era or the early consulate. Um, and... just making a really nice point here. Yes, if this was Neil Mura, uh, and I think that I feel that very strongly. Oh, but yes. in some respects, not having a Mura in there is a mistake because Massively. you could play with that. The trouble with putting Mura on a big screen is that you would bankrupt Hollywood with the costume <laughs> budget because the guy took flamboyant uniforms to another level. Oh, yes. I mean, this is one of the... You, you, we get a distinct lacking lack of kind of... You know, a heightening of distraction for those who know what they're looking at um, at this point. You get the pyramids thing, and then you get this. And this... You know, you said it at the beginning, he was wrestled to the floor by his staff at Arcola. Um, that's because you don't want the general in command of the army to get his head blown off. This is class A, the written in the book of how you get yourself killed um, in, a, in, a, in a 19th, 18th century battle, right? Yes. And this is just something that you don't do. I agree entirely. General, high-ranking generals of division, marshals indeed, could lead cavalry charges. But they were usually cavalrymen. You get it? And I honestly don't know of a historical reference for Napoleon ever doing something so stupid. Wellington did it in India once, at least, literally yes. led cavalry. But... I mean, there are a few instances where he has to draw his sword and run away with some cavalry as well. Yeah. 
uh, where mm -hmm. he risks being captured, but that's not what's what's playing out no. here. So... Notice the generals run away from stuff that's going to kill them because they need they're in command of the army. You know, look what happened. I mean, sure, the, an army can survive that. Abercrombie got killed, Moore got killed, but and, and the battles went on. Nevertheless, it's not good for the rest of the campaign, is it? <laughs> no, it's really not. Um, somebody also making the point um, why the sabers in the the left arm. I, I think oh, we have a goodness. reversed shot. Wow. Here, yeah, that's a good um, point. Quite simply, because yes, you, you would. Uh, hold the still, in, in yeah. The right this, I, I remember seeing stills of this, and they're and charging the opposite. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, they clearly decided that they need to flick the footage around yeah, for whatever reason. reason. Um, I suggest you take the throne. There's a king. This bit here. So, okay, uh, okay, Josh. I'm gonna, just going to leave you to to seethe about this Brumaire coup scene. Well. We, we can we can move on with the Brumaire coup bit because there's a little bit after this. What I was just going to point out is that little section before that, that's 1815 or I'm a Dutchman. That's when he comes back and gets welcomed back. You know, he's wearing his great coat. Yes. He's wearing yes. His, his chasseur cheval. Yes, um, absolutely. Again, French... iconic painting, right? Yeah. Being, being encapsulated here, mm -hmm. um, particularly oh, if we oh, look a, forward to... Exactly. Yeah, there we go. That. There we go. Uh, um, cross, you know, Les Gens Exactly. It has to be. Ah, fifth line. There you go. Those are there the boys. Go. If you um, want to kill the emperor, here I am. Yeah. So, yes, again, this raises all kinds of questions about what's I, 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 being I, 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 I know it's. I know, I know the propaganda machine at work, but I do so hope he did that. Because in a way, I, I, I actually wanted... I, I would have liked it if Napoleon was everything he was supposed to be. Sadly, I know he wasn't. But if he actually went out in front of those muskets and said, if you want to kill your emperor, here I am. That is just deserving of, of some respect. <laughs> but interestingly, Napoleon has this, uh, and this is a whole episode that we will do at some point. Um, the, the expert on this has been in the chat. Ed Koss has done a lot of work on Napoleon's psychology. Um, Absolutely fascinating research mon, that's being mon, done. Uh, mon général, mon empereur, from, uh, from he, he'll know what I mean. Yes, he <laughs> will. Um, but Ed's doing some really interesting work looking at Napoleon's kind of mental state when it comes to suicide. And there are indications that Napoleon has a really fatalistic attitude to life. Uh, he writes a treatise on suicide um, at one point. Um, he, there have been claims that actually he's carrying poison that wouldn't have done anything to him. Okay. Not so. Actually, it, Ed went and spoke to leading chemists about what would this stuff do if you actually took it? And the response was emphatically, it's going to kill you and it's going to kill you hard. Um, <laughs> so I do wonder if, you know, Napoleon sort of looking at the option of a fatalistic way out um think about at waterloo he rides forward with his imperial guard he, and then has to sort of be persuaded no don't go any further he uh, even and writes... he ends up about halfway across that field yeah. he ends up w well within range mm. one cannonball could have been yeah. it for him. And th this speaks a little of what we were saying earlier about generals and and how much risk they would take they took a lot of risks by modern standards they did have to actually see what they were looking, what what they needed to do, because of just the nature of how warfare was. So there's just levels by which you can expose yourself to danger. And Napoleon, I mean, and as and in the case of Waterloo, Napoleon seemed to try to um, kill, get get killed or die gloriously. He even writes later that he should have died at uh, in Moscow or at at Waterloo, and then he would have been a legend. Um, so this is all very. Uh, very, very good stuff from Ed. Okay. Take the throne as a king. On. Shall we vote? Right. This is this do, is interesting. Do you want to rant about this, or do you want me to rant about this? We can both rant about this, but first hey. of all, first of all, if that it could be Talleyrand. Or somebody who's telling him we want you to be king, they're skipping ahead a bit. Mm -hmm. But um, he's he because and you can tell this because he's wearing a red, as in another famous painting, and that's his first consul's uniform. 
they're doing very excellent work with getting a lot of Napoleon sort of material culture in here. Yes, uh, but I'm not surprised by that. Uh, a lot of people said, oh, the costume's going to look naff. I disagree. I th I'm mm -hmm. sure that there are inaccuracies, without a doubt. Lots of people pointing those out. There always will be, but they they work really hard on costume um, because they know that people will try and pick them up on on yeah. those failings so exactly. so you yeah. want to go first or do you want uh, me to go first? <laughs> oh lord um right so i suppose the first thing we need to do is set the record straight on the brumaire coup mm. right so that's probably the logical way to do this um we have this perception that napoleon just sweeps in we as in the popular perception is that napoleon sort of sweeps in sends in the uh, the grenadiers and the government topples. And in the process, we completely ignore the fact that Napoleon nearly bungles this coup. In some respects, does bungle this yeah, coup. Yeah. It's Lucian, his brother, yep. who, as we discussed earlier, is being played by, uh, apologies, let me consult my notes, by Matthew Needham. Um, it's Lucian who's crucial to this. He gets a very hostile reaction from both councils so not just from the council of 500 which is the one that uh, we talk about the council of the ancients are, yes. are heckling him they're yes. they're sort of going on about um how this is this is a betrayal um and what about the constitution and napoleon allegedly bites back with you know you've you violated the constitution um it no longer has the respect of anyone and then he goes to the Council of 500 yes. and gets assaulted, as in he nearly dies. He <laughs> nearly gets bludgeoned to death. Um, and it's Lucian who basically brings in the, the grenadiers and clears the room. So I was, I, I, was, yeah, I was looking into this today. It's, it's a fascinating story and it would be a wonderful political thriller to do something about, like a, a, a psychological kind of political thing about how Napoleon comes to power. Uh, the Brumaire is replete with nonsense. The whole plan is hatched to gain control of the government through the fact that that day, the, the two councils, the two houses of the French government were going to dismiss the... Um, uh, I see it, I see it, I've just seen a, a question come up there's General O'Hara um, who surrendered his sword to both Washington and Napoleon, although he may have actually surrendered his sword to a Colonel Suchet, who was also at Toulon. But it's unclear. Either way, he would have had to have been brought to Napoleon. Um, so, yeah, unlucky guy. But um, the whole plot was because the old government was being dismissed the directory was going to be folded and they were going to appoint three consuls. The two houses were supposed to sit and one was supposed to do one thing and one was supposed to do the other thing. Lucien said, I'm going to take Council of the 500 and I'm going to get them to appoint a special commission to figure out enemies of uh, what is threatening the Republic right now. And you, bro, you go and get yourself appointed with uh, Serrier, or however you pronounce his name, consuls, and then we'll pretty much just be running everything. So unfortunately, they were kind of undone by the fact that the French uh, um, government at the time, the houses of the French government couldn't really agree on anything. And the Jacobins had tipped off the Council of the 500 that there was a bunch of military dictator, you know, wannabes going to try and do stuff today. And the entire day just ground into arguments, leaving no opportunity for any actual opening to get things done. Like literally the docket was interrupted by their own arguments. Lucien was arguing in the other room and then Napoleon said, I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna address the Council of the Ancients. And somebody said to him, well, I think it was probably Serio. And uh, he said, um, is that a really good idea? And Napoleon's supposed to have said something dramatic like, uh, the wine has been pressed, I have to drink it. And he goes in and he just embarks on this unstoppably moronic address. He wasn't a good That's speaker. That's what you really think, Josh. He wasn't a very good speaker, to be fair. He, didn't, he wasn't confident in public speaking. And when he got to the part where he said, we must save the Republic, we must save liberty, 
which was save equality, which was supposed to be the rallying cry, some wag in the seats chimed in. And what about the Constitution? <laughs> <laughs> and he just loses it and he starts arguing with them and at the end of it somehow he got the impression that he'd won and he'd rallied them and he stormed out very tall and proud and wanders into the, wanders into the orangery this this all took place in the in the chamber of Apollo and um saint Clara, i think and he goes into the orangery which is where the council of the 500 sit and as soon as i see the uniform they're on him basically. Military coup, get him! And he has to get dragged out, like you say. He's in such a state, he's pale, he's not, he's partially conscious, uh, he's only partially conscious, and he, he gets, has to be taken to a separate room, and he's in, he, he gets a rash because he's so aggravated, and he scratches it so much while he's thinking what to do, he draws blood. Then, <laughs> while Lucian is busy trying to not get him declared an outlaw, his uh, close supporters in, in the room where he is basically says, well, we've tried it the constitutional way. The only way we're going forward now is, well, we got a lot of soldiers outside, right? Um, and indeed, he had, he had 6,000 troops in Paris, not counting the legislative guard outside in the, in the courtyard. So he draws his sword and he goes to the window and he yells out some stuff. And then he runs downstairs and, and asks for a horse and he's given this particularly, <laughs> this particularly wild one which he has trouble mounting, but he eventually gets on top of it and he rides over to the legislative guard and he says, you, we got to go save the Republic. And they're like, who's this? And then he, okay, right, nothing from that. And he goes over and he gets to the line infantry, the infantry, the line, the guys who know him and um, Sebastiani's dragoons. And he's like, hey, boys, we got to go do stuff. They just tried to assault me in there. Look at the blood that I did not just cause myself. They tried to attack me with daggers. And meanwhile, and roughly about this time, two very important things happen. First of all, the, 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 Lucien is, has basically sent a message out to say, if you're going to act, act now. And he's done this grand gesture where he's taken off his robes, of, his consulate robes, and laid them down on the floor. This gives Napoleon the, the excuse to go in and gets his brother out. He does this, and then, then, then Lucien gets out, he asks for a dragoon's horse, and they both go riding around the troops, and uh, touting that the, the, the houses have gone mad, and they're trying to kill, they're trying to kill us, and there's a coup in go going on. And um, this, is where I, this is where I believe that Murat has to be in this show somewhere, because Murat, who has been brawling with the representatives in the chamber to save Napoleon. He was literally there. He was a very big guy. He was from Gascony and he, he liked to brawl. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to, apologies to interrupt he, you. I just want to throw in um, a little comment from Rachel Stark, who I mentioned earlier, does a, a running feature for me over on the podcast that's attached to, now attached to the channel. Um, and she, she and I did a, a long breakdown of Murat and his life and we both agreed that the episode had to be titled Murat, all balls and no brains <laughs> the, guys, that... the guy yeah. had cojones there's, there's no denying it he did, he was there, he's the guy you wanted around at that time, Napoleon he was very useful to Napoleon very loyal to Napoleon, he just did what he was told, he was capable enough to do it it's interesting actually that um, Augereau and Jourdan were there as well at the time and it's posited that if they had taken command of the grenadiers of the legislative guard, they could have quashed this rebellion and taken power themselves, actually, but they stood back, allowing Murat to take in a column of grenadiers, secure the chamber, and one of the accounts I one of the versions I've read is he gets up on the podium and says the the the, the council is dismissed get this lot out, clear this lot out, he said. And they cleared, they cleared the room and Lucien did the rest. And I went on too much, but it's a, it's a really crazy, amazing story. It really that, is. Um, and it's, I don't, it's very I don't... contrary to the, the story that you would expect, the, uh, the story that we have, right? Which mm. is, it's all about Napoleon. Napoleon goes in and we draw that, immediately we draw that line. 
Napoleon goes in, he's key in instigating all of this, which isn't really the case. You then draw that line onto Napoleon becomes first consul, onto Napoleon becomes emperor, and you have this trajectory that, that is very kind of seductive. What I did notice is that Hawkin is very out, out of breath. breath. He now, is, out is of breath. that yes. he's just climbed the, climbed the steps of the palace, unlikely, or is it he's just been in the midst of a brawl and they're going to squash the timeline and, you know, the troops come in and they, they rally around their man, Napoleon, um, and then you get this brilliant one-liner, Shall we vote? Well, shall we vote? That I, I, yeah, I saw exactly the same thing. I'm thinking you're a bit out of breath here, Napoleon. There's a scene we're not seeing here, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out because it's a very dramatic, pivotal thing in his life, and they're going to have fun with it. I think. Absolutely. Well, let's hope so. Again, Again just, just, just a David painting turned into film, right? Um, mm -hmm. And done well, in mm. my humble opinion. I don't know where they filmed this. I suspect there is a large it's, amount of CGI I, going on. I there. believe that I saw yesterday. It's either it's it's one of the our cathedrals. Actually, it's the British cathedral. Um, well, the the Vendomier scenes were done at Greenwich, weren't they? Uh, they could have been. I don't know. Part they of were. The, yeah, no, it, I, it, I, I was posing that as a question for you to agree to, but yes, they were. Um, uh, thinking about it, yeah, it looks like it. <laughs> okay. No, the, I, I, I think it's Lincoln or Norwich or something. I yeah, saw David yesterday. English is coming in here saying Lincoln Cathedral. No, it's it would have been fun if they could have actually used Notre Dame, but well, yeah, um, being a the fire. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, maybe the extra light from above. <laughs> no, Josh. Been, I, I, know, no. I know they, they need the money to, to rebuild the thing, but See, I, I don't think Hollywood could, could have kicked in a couple of pounds for the re, re, <laughs> to do Notre Dame. Anyway, no, it looks very good. It's it it's, certainly it's, does. It's, they've done they've done their research well. They've done the painting. Didn't Napoleon say something that when he he himself went to see the David that it's like more it's like it's more glorious than it was or something like that mm -hmm. or. Again, they've they've really gone to town on the the costume for Vanessa Kirby mm -hmm. here. Um, so I I don't have an issue with the costumes. I think that for me, this is just my opinion. There's enough of attention to detail yeah. to get close enough um, that actually, as a visual depiction, I'm I'm excited to see this and mm -hmm. just sit back and enjoy the whole thing. They've obviously gone and looked at the portraits uh, and and the paintings and the studies and stuff, and they've designed the the, uh, they've done what they should have done with the budget for the costumes, right? Because the, the material, the sources are there for them to do it. And for this scene particularly, um, it, was, it was a good decision to do. This vermin has held the world hostage with his egotism and his lack of... As you say, it's tea and biscuits. And oh, I say, this is, this is terrible. Uh, what I will say, actually is, I, I don't know if this is the case and whether they've done this level of depth of research, but Rupert Everett sounds quite similar to the current Duke of Wellington. If you ever have met mm -hmm. current Wellington, and I've had that privilege on a handful of occasions, he sounds quite similar to this, and I don't know if that's deliberate or whether that's just, I'm going to put on generic posh guy voice. Rupert Everett has a... That is quite close to how Rupert Everett speaks. I've never, to be honest, heard Rupert Everett speak in anything other than that sort of okay. tone. So he comes to it very naturally. Um, how I don't actually have a problem with uh, anybody doing a Wellington that sounds like that. Um, because, to be honest, uh, uh, first, I don't know exactly when it comes about, but certainly by the 1850s, if you've ever listened to the recording of Florence Nightingale, then there is a distinct accent being used, uh, which we would call the, I believe, received pronunciation or something like that, or heightened received pronunciation. Queen's English, essentially. King's English. Um, and that would fit. In fact, actually, I would encourage people playing British aristocrats to to do that 
to look at old war movies and stuff and see how they talked in them and to do them. Um, my problem is the stuff they get them to say. Yes. Um, the lack of good manners, as if that's... Boss. <laughs> as if, yes, Britain goes to war because Napoleon doesn't know the correct order with which to use his cutlery at dinner. Yes, um, exactly. This is exactly the sort of thing Wellington had problems with Napoleon about. This is he—he he insulted him a couple of times by saying he wasn't a gentleman. That doesn't mean that he thought that he had bad manners. That meant that he—he he didn't have the breeding to do the job, really. <laughs> Yeah, um, this is an interesting concept in terms of the line that they might go down, which is poor Napoleon, pity him, yes. all of these um, nasty allies and, yeah. club together, gang up on him because they don't like him, because he's inverted commas come from nothing, even though he hasn't, but shush, mm -hmm. let's, let's ignore that. That's actually where this might stumble um, by sort of perpetuating that Napoleon's a man of peace myth, which is absolute rubbish. Napoleon is yeah. not a man of peace. Napoleon no. loves a war, is offered <laughs> peace and turns it down because he knows he's good at it. He's good at and it. This is, this is the point that I've made many times on, on the podcast. If you know that you have that capability, you're going to choose violence, to coin a Game of Thrones term, <laughs> because you're, you, the odds are stacked in your favour that you're going to win. So, yes, this might be sort of leading, it, leading us down that... Mm -hmm. um, ever, ever since Christopher Plummer, there has not been a Wellington depiction that has not shown him as some stuffy reactionist aristocrat that is more concerned about the neatness or the manners of somebody than actually getting a job done. And this is why I dread the day they actually do something about the Duke of Wellington because it will be absolutely appalling, really, because. <laughs> Somebody's yeah. suggesting Fassbender as an amazing Wellington. I, I can kind of see that. I that used to work. Wa yeah, he could. He's he's a little cleaner than he should be, but it's Hollywood. Uh, like he's a little cleaner cut. I mean, in terms of how he looks, but that could work. I used to think Benedict Cumberbatch would be a good idea if they put a nose on him. Yes. Um, there's a thought. A Sherlock. Kind of a, a Sherlock very, Wellington. The, all the Wellingtons you ever see from Christopher Plummer, like I don't count Christopher Plummer, even Hugh Fraser, who does a very creditable job, they're very soft, right? They're mm -hmm. very kind of. I'm. I'm just. Uh, I just. I just do what the king says. Uh, oh dear, is that the French? My goodness. Oh, they don't look very clean. Um, that sort of thing. Wellington. We need another uh, thing about Wellington, but we do. It, well, this it is always, the, the it always annoys me. <laughs> this is what people have called for, right? You know, why have we, why have we got a Napoleon film? We should have a Wellington film. Well, actually, if I'm being really honest, in terms of selling tickets, which is fundamentally what this film has to do, I think you get better value for money by telling Napoleon's story than you yeah. do by selling Wellingtons. You do. Um, now, does that mean that we? if this does well, we might see depictions of others. I don't know. Um, there's there's certainly a, a fascinating story to be told when it comes to Wellington's life. But actually the fact that we haven't got a Wellington movie, we've got a Napoleon movie, I'm fine with that. Yeah. No, I don't have an issue with that. But... I am relieved. I am relieved that it's about Napoleon because I think they will do a much better, more respectful job for Napoleon than they will for Wellington. Case in point, the amount of shows that they did during the bicentennial, de, bicentennial about of Waterloo about Napoleon versus the one documentary they did about how cruel Wellington was to the women in his life, um, you know. which is fair. He, <laughs> he was a rubbish husband. Well, um, again, you see, that's the popular perception. If you get into it, yes, you, he's not he's not kind to uh, Kitty or anything like that. But it, it gets blown out of all proportion completely, um, and it missed the entire point that the closest friends he had tended to be women. Yes, that is true. Wellington liked in so sorry folks, we've gone off on one about <laughs> Wellington. Um, but this is this is this is a flavor of what happens on the podcast. You know, we <laughs> we go deep into the rabbit holes. Um, so if you like that stuff, stick around, like and subscribe. Shameless plug. Um, 
Wellington liked the company of intelligent women, um, not necessarily women who idolised him. He yes. didn't like that sort of fawning style of individual. He didn't and like it from anybody. From Kitty. Um, yes. Kitty, they were just badly matched and yeah. should never have married, quite frankly. But he, there were times when he was, I they would came... say, crueler than he needed she... to be. Yes, uh, that was unfortunately his nature, though, to everybody. That's true. Um, and she caught the flack of that, and she didn't understand it. She didn't understand, because she didn't understand him, and he didn't understand her, and they didn't try. She tried to she tried to make it up to him the only way she knew, which was to idolize him, mm. therefore completely missing the point that that is just going to make things worse. And he reacted the way he reacted to a subaltern who had annoyed him. Yes. Essentially. And it didn't um, help the... The, the nation idolizes him whilst he's away. They're, they're separated for years, yeah. for almost the entirety of the Peninsula War. Which, so from 1809 through to 1814, they literally don't see each other. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's hard to maintain a relationship. Yeah. I mean, talk about I'm, a long distance relationship. I, I'm not you saying you don't see them for <laughs> five years. Exactly. And I'm not saying that he should be given a. a I'm saying that basically I always try to say that we got to try not to be too judgy about these people. And the, you know, the, the fact that the fact that Wellington was the way he was, is, is really none of our, none of out of our control. Um, but I thought it was funny during the bicentennial that the one sh show Wellington got was literally about his personal life and Napoleon mm -hmm. got proper coverage at the time and that's what we're going to get basically uh, rightfully here this is napoleon's movie yes. and if wellington is the villain then well i would have chosen a different actor than rupert everett but <laughs> we, uh, we got we got to do some we got to do better with depictions of the duke of wellington because uh, the, the wellington i'm familiar with would have eaten this guy for breakfast yes um hey if anybody's interested in having a historical advisor to a production on Wellington, Josh might be your guy. Um, call his people. Of <laughs> simple good manners. Like that, like that in a big way. That was one of those moments where I went, yes, thank you. He was all of those things. Mm. Um, and this is what, this is where the, the encouragement comes to it. Yes, you've got that, that line that's on all the posters came from nothing, conquered everything. Well, no, he didn't. And then also, P.S., he also lost everything, if you want to talk about the everythings, because he pushed it too far. That's the story of his downfall. And yet, they are putting in here, yes, he was a tyrant. Sure he was. He was a dictator. Of course he was a tyrant. That shouldn't surprise us. And we shouldn't be sort of insulted by that. Mm -hmm. um, he, took, he took power. He took power. It was then given to him constitutionally to hold it. But uh, he was dictatorial in many ways. It's you can't get around the fact that this is <laughs> he brought order, but he brought order through a particular method. I think you're great. Oh, I just put something together. That's that burning scene. I was wondering. I was going to ask you about that, but I figured. Okay, I I think I've clocked it. I think I know what's happening. Well, those are red. That's There's a red a jacket. Uh, yes, he's a consul or something, or maybe just a red jacket. This must be the infernal machine. Oh, yes. Yes. Good shout. Good shout. Okay. So that's interesting that we've. I've got only a lot just talked about now. Even I've if they only just, just did it now. a few minutes on each of these. Um, yes, so thank you, Jean Charles. In, in our excitement, we're we're not yes exactly explaining ourselves properly. Jean Charles Blanc coming in and explaining the assassination attempt. Yes, um, that's there's yes, a lot this, crammed this, in here. This is the famous assassination attempt which occurred, and I for, I forget the proper name it has. You do please put it in the comments um, because I only literally just put this together right now. That that is what this is. It, it flashes past so fast, I missed it completely. But basically, they, uh, there's an assassination attempt. They try to blow him up, and um, they almost succeed. And it's one of the one of the first crime scene investigations in history that is um, that is like properly done. The incredibly sinister Fouché steps yes. into the limelight out of the shadows, and he tracks down 
one of the guys who did it by finding a mule's leg or something like that and figuring out from the hoof who owned the mule. <laughs> Fouché and this story, and again, see the book in the comments uh, by Jonathan North for more details. This is an amazing story in its own. And I love the fact that it's basically Napoleonic crime scene investigation from the secret police by Fouché, who is literally as sinister as his reputation. Yes. And portraits suggest. Yes. Which is a great, <laughs> which is a great achievement. <laughs> it really is. Um, again, if you want more on Fouché, this is why there is a podcast, people. Uh, I sat down with a leading expert on um, terrorism within a 19th century context. So I sat down with Professor Beatrice de Graaf from Utrecht University, and we talked about um, Fouché and, and the style of terror that it, that is created by the Fouché system and the way in which actually this is a system that gets plucked up by the other powers after Napoleon's defeat and gets copied almost as if it's a playbook by the other absolutist powers um, over the course of the rest of the 19th century. You think you're great? You are just a tiny little brute that it is nothing without me. I do love that line. I do love, I know it, it's overhyped. Um, and it's it, very nice. It's very nice and it bodes well for the wider context of their relationship. So I can't wait to see how that plays mm. out. All of Europe is uniting forces against me. What's the outcome of this if you don't succeed? Your Majesty, we are discovered. Good. Oh dear. Oh dear, so up, oh dear, oh dear. Up to this point then, uh, I, I've seen stuff about the flags and on his big map being wrong. Um, but he, he is he's correct. This is correct, Napoleon. Europe did unite against Napoleon. He united Europe against Russia at one point, but generally speaking, this is true. And he did, he did, that was what he told everybody as well, that everybody's against me. I'm a man of peace. I just go and thrash them around a bit to defend us. Um, nice, nice energy from him. He, he's, he's you're getting kind of superhero Napoleon um, in, in, in this strange wooded area, which I guess is meant to be. Pratton Heights, maybe I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> it's also I know it's it's winter, but it's too dark. Um, it is yeah. it's sort of slightly irritatingly dark. As yeah. A lot of films do um, that. Um, Jean-Charles talk... Blanc has beaten us to it, though. Yeah, um, good old by John. talking about um, the, the the they were ponds, really. Yes, yes, rather they were than lakes. They were yeah, lake. ponds. Uh, you get the they literally called that. Um, rather than sort of a whole division, um, they they drained the lake. So this is Napoleonic, this is Napoleon's account. You know, yeah, this um, idea that hundreds of men, the, the estimates vary, 200 to 2,000 is the other figures that are bandied around. They then drained them and they found uh, two or three men and about 150 horses. So yeah, uh, it's... Uh, you need only look at the work of Alexander Mikibaredze, um and he will debunk that myth. He talks to me about it on a, uh, when I talk to him on my channel. If you want to check that out, it's there for you. Adventures um, in History Land, go and subscribe. And yeah, it's a, it's a total myth. Um, but it gets this gets worse actually. Oh, it it's not just that they, it's not just that they use this; it's how they use it. Uh, and this is one of those moments where I think it's important to make a point in in Michael Brewer's favor. So we've talked about and people have confirmed um, in the comments, thank you for um, doing the, the, the groundwork for me in, in confirming that, that Michael Brewer is the historical advisor to Ridley on this. Um, but the, the, the historical advisor is there to advise and it is the director's privilege to ignore that advice yeah. if they feel that it benefits the storytelling. Um, so what you will have here is a situation where I am sure Michael will have turned around because he is eminently qualified when it comes to this research. Um, and he will have said, look, this is, this is not the case, but they're trying to tell a story 
and yes. they want to throw this in here. And this is what is really interesting, that even though Michael will have turned around and said, that's not so, um, they are still engaging with the complex moral questions that come from this idea that so Napoleon fires on the ice so that these retreating soldiers fall into the freezing water and drown en masse. They're making you kind of go, okay, I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah. Um, because some people will turn around and go, oh, well, it's war and people need to stop being woke and grow up and all the rest of it. But no, <laughs> no, never mind. That's that's not really the point here. The point is that they're, they're showing you something that's not right, but they're making you engage with precisely that question of, is that okay? Was that right? How do I feel about Napoleon now that I know that happened, even though in reality what I think I know happened didn't actually happen? Uh, it's curious. Um, it's very curious. I think it's going to be explained by the fact they have retooled it, that he will not be firing on fleeing soldiers. If you'll note that we are discovered, good. Um, as if he's luring them into a trap on the ice, which bodes very ill for any depiction of Austerlitz that is going to be put put, put on the screen. Um, I think... advocate, maybe that's that's a reference to him throwing the dummy at Austerlitz, um, and withdrawing True, in we order don't know. to sucker them in. We truly don't know. This is a disjointed bit of trailer it we're is. working from, so it could be that too. I'm possibly um, being too generous there, but I'm just throwing that in there as devil's advocate. We'll, we'll find out. We'll find out that's true. Good. That's a good point. Um, in a second, one of the soldiers is going to say it's a trap. Again, making me worry yes um but... but the thing that really makes me worry is what's about to come it's a trap! But, <laughs> exactly you know this is this is your sort of master and commander <laughs> let fly moment um i've i've disguised my what intentions um and you know i'm just going to whip the tarpaulin off of this extensive battery of guns because that's that how you would have noticed <laughs> Um, the, 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 the Austrian cavalry and the Russian cavalry um, haven't picked up on this through their scouting. Because this is just how you win battles in the early 19th century. I feel that there's a sort of slight wish to hark back to what we see in the opening sequence of Gladiator. Right? Yeah. You know, this idea of there's a tree line, artillery, you know, lots of fire and brimstone and all the rest of it. Um, Ridley, Ridley does love his cavalry charging through trees, doesn't he? He does. He does. Um, so yes, this is this is the most problematic bit of the trailer of the entire trailer for me. Um, even uh, even the pyramids. This is yeah, for me, yeah. this is worse than the pyramids. This didn't um, even happen. Exactly. He, I mean, the the pyramids thing. I mean, he, at least he saw the pyramids. At least he was sort of equidistant to them. This is like. What, I don't even know what it is. It's we seem to have broken you, Josh. You seem to be lost for words at this point. Well, which, yeah, having I mean, spent it's... many hours podcasting with you, it's... I find it's baffling. one. Th it's one. Th it's because it's one thing to say, okay, we're going to do the ponds thing. Um, sure, okay, part of the legend of Austerlitz. Oh, I'm so surprised you've gone with the legend. Print the legend, right? This suggests a whole Machiavellian scheme to lure them onto in front of a. One, two, three, four, five, five guns under tarpaulins, um, utterly invisible in the snow. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, problems. It's, I am lost. I am lost for words. I, I, I have no idea how they're fitting this into this movie. I have no idea. I have. I have no. I have ideas about how theatrical this battle is going to become and how sort of badass and epic it's going to look, or something. But. Oh, Somebody's yes, making yes. an interesting point here uh, in terms of just giving them the benefit of the doubt. Um, thank you, Sullies, for this. Could be a scene where Napoleon is describing what happened and shows his propaganda perspective. Maybe. Could be. Potentially. They would, that's, they that's would quite require kind of they, would re they would require an, uh, a, ca a standing character who is the opposite of that, though. Otherwise, it's just the truth. Neil is coming in with a damning self assessment. It's, so it's sort of indicative of luring your enemy into an offensive, as he did. 
but it's straining my limited <laughs> powers of charity. <laughs> that is a point. Yes, it, it could be allegory. It um, could be. It could yeah, be. and 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 I honestly, I do think that if they go with the simplistic, my evil plan is to lure them onto what is presumably a camp in front of me or a town, onto the ice, destroy the ice, and attack them. If that's my evil spidery plan, then um, that could be allegory. But uh, it's it's like. Because be, uh, then they're doing that because Austerlitz is, is quite a complicated battle to show in uh, the amount of time, and they want something that's easy to read. I think that if they go with this this sort of trickster version um, and ignoring the sort of the, the the brilliance of the psychology of of using the ground that way, knowing that they're divided, knowing that he can he can get them to do what he wants them to do when he wants them to do it, they're going to ignore that and sort of go for a much more cheaper version, it's because they think the audience won't be able to follow this, yeah. the actual to and fro thing, I guess. I must say, though, and this was the segment that I put into the, the introduction to um, my, my breakdown, my reaction video, there's an immediate redeeming feature <laughs> from this. Immediately so. Watch this. I'm the first to admit when I make a mistake... I simply never do. Yes, that's it, right? That's Napoleon. That yeah. is absolutely <laughs> an appreciation of the guy's character. If nothing else, between Wacken's intensity as Napoleon and the scripting they're putting in there and this relationship with Josephine, they have understood the man better than any on-screen depiction that I've seen mm -hmm. and far better than I dared hope. And that, for me, is what I'm going to love about this, that we are getting as close to a warts and all impression of the guy as you're realistically going to get out of Hollywood. Yeah. I, like I said the, earlier on, um, it's definitely not I'm hero Napoleon. Napoleon is incredibly... What we have here is um, a depiction in the trailer of an incredibly capable, invincible kind of godlike figure, but one that is that is 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 most certainly a very complicated one that did um, that that did various things to stay in power, and I think that is going to be at the crux of a lot of this as well as the the the, the, the things that Napoleon has to do. He came from nothing and conquered everything. Yes, problematically, is Carlo Bonaparte a joke to you? Um, but it's like, at the same time, we must acknowledge that he had a very difficult time getting ahead in the world because of the choices his father made, and he had, and the choices he made were choices that helped him stay in power and helped him lose it at the same time. So I think that's that looks like. Is going to be a big part of the movie, which is very good. Uh, Alex makes the important point fundamentally of where are the minions? Yes. Um, stay, away, stay away from the cannons, Napoleon. Look out. Yes. Well, just just watch out for just watch out for the minions. Quite frankly, because they are a menace. Um, if you haven't seen the minions movie, folks, I, I'm not going to do a reaction trailer <laughs> to, <laughs> reaction to the minions movie. We're just not going there. Not on this show. Um, but it is fantastic. It plays into a lot of tropes about Napoleon um, <laughs> that I'll be talking about at other places, other shows, other times. Um, it's an ep epic line, though. It's an epic line. Absolutely. Dave Holland's making the point that there is evidence that he had the Allied plan. Um, <laughs> there was, yes, the yes, yes, the Allied plan. <laughs> the yes. one that put Kutuzov um, to sleep. <laughs> uh, and then uh, we've got a very generous um comment coming in that yes the there are going to be some things that we're going to sit here and suck our teeth about but actually there are some important things that need to come through yeah. in this story and and I think they are doing um there's there's a whole thing that people misunderstand about movies in is that uh, much what I said at the beginning when I was talking about the Musée de l'Armée video um history and movies do different things um a movie is not required to tell you the truth. It can be good and inaccurate at the same time. It can be in. It can be accurate and bad at the same time. 
a movie has to fit something cohesive and and worth telling as a story into three acts or thereabout, and you just cannot. I mean, just you heard my description of the Brumaire. Put that into a movie in a way that people will watch it verbatim and make money from it. Try, because it won't happen. You think the coming people don't want to see Napoleon wandering in and out of buildings. You go in once and do the job and carry the story along. That is what people want to see. That is how stories are told. And you have to try and convey a truth about the story through the action. And some movies are able to do that. Maybe this one will be able to do that too. Let us hope so. Um, and we will call a halt there for this one. Josh, it's been an absolute joy having you on. My friend, you always deliver. Folks, you need to go and subscribe to the Adventures in Historyland YouTube channel where you will find ample evidence of Josh's good humour and wit, as well as some incredibly interesting conversations across a whole range of historical topics, Napoleonic, but also much more besides. Um, I particularly enjoy your vlog in which you describe a bunch of cows as, and I quote, the heavy brigade during <laughs> one of your um, adventures. So folks, do go and subscribe to Josh's uh, YouTube channel. You will also find his book, Bullock's Grain and Good Madeira, on the British campaign in India, the Maratha and Jat campaigns, uh, available at hellion.co.uk. Uh, please go and order direct if you have the opportunity, because that's the best way that you can support um, independent bookselling companies and also Josh himself. Um, but it's a book that is well worth your time. That is going to be it for our first live stream. Um, please do, if you're enjoying this, remember to whack that like button and the subscribe button, ring the notification bell as well so that you can find your way back. If you're particularly fired up about all of this, there are ways that you can support this show. This is how folks like myself and Josh have to work out how to earn a living. And much though this is um, the sort of the cynical part of the live stream, uh, if you are able to support either with a one-off tip um, through Ko-fi or by becoming a, a patron of the show via Patreon. There are details uh, ticking across the bottom of your screen. Now, your generosity would be hugely appreciated. I have a number of plans in the pipeline to show you footage from battlefields and show you battlefields like you've never seen them before, because I want to take you in the air. I want to show you drone footage of these sites, which is incredibly exciting. Um, that is, however, it after two hours and 11 minutes of the inaugural live stream. I'm Dr. Zach White. I've been your host. This has been the Napoleonic Wars channel. Take care of yourselves, my friends. Stay well, stay safe. And for the first time ever, I get to say this. Thank you for watching. <laughs>